morning and welcome back to IndyCar on the, what is it, the 11th of October today. Now a couple of you have been asking me the question, has the Stirling Directive been rejected by the Scottish Government? Because I know there is a rumour going around, uh, probably on X, or the, the platform formerly known as Twitter, um, that the Scottish Government has actually rejected the Stirling Directive. Now this, as far as we know, is not true. In fact, I contacted Sarah Salvers at Salvo and at the committee which organised uh, and wrote the Stirling Directive and apparently there hasn't been any response so far uh, to the Stirling Directive's delivery to Holyrood recently. Now this doesn't mean that it won't happen. And in fact, um, Sarah tells me that uh, Salvo and the committee intend to write to the First Minister to ask him for clarification. Now, one of the clarification points is that the Scottish Government really, when reading the Stirling Directive, is being asked to take a position. And to describe this in, in fairly simple terms, asking a question, does the First Minister and the, the SNP Government accept that under the constitution of uh, the Scottish state and under the terms of the Treaty of Union that Scottish voters, in other words you and I, Scottish citizens are actually the sovereign authority here. And if they do not, do they then agree that Scotland therefore must be a crown dependency or in other words a colony of the United Kingdom because they can't take both positions at once. It's all very well for a Scottish government to say that the people of Scotland are sovereign and to bandy this phrase around, but they actually have to acknowledge the legality of it and the legitimacy of it publicly, otherwise it has no force, it has no effect on what we can and cannot do. So I think it's important now for the First Minister to look at this seriously and to decide as a government, not just for the First Minister to decide this, but for the whole government of Scotland to decide which thing they think is true. Are the people of Scotland the sovereign authority over their own destiny or are they not? And if they are not, then does that mean Scotland is a crown dependency? Because they can't be both at the same time. This is not a Schrodinger's cat situation where it can be both until you actually look at it. It's not that kind of situation. And it's very important that the Scottish Government actually states out loud or in writing exactly what its position is. Because other than that, the people of Scotland do not know how their government views their sovereignty. They might say that we're sovereign, but they're not acting as though we are. Uh, and they're not using the sovereignty in the way it was intended. So that's the first point. Now the second point is an interesting one. You may have heard of the Convention of the Estates. Now this was, in times past, um, essentially it started out as a committee which met when the lawful uh, government of Scotland could not sit. In other words, when the monarch was not able to be present. And the Convention of the Estates is unusual. It doesn't exist in England. There is no, um, there's no equivalent in England. You know, if the Parliament of Westminster couldn't sit for some reason uh, in the past, there was no other alternative. There was no other um, legislative body which could take those decisions. However, Scotland has always had this as a kind of backup plan, an emergency government which can operate and legislate, and this is the key thing, it had and has the legislative competence to take decisions on behalf of the entire nation on issues that affected the entire population. And this distinction makes it, I think, probably the most powerful weapon that the Scottish Parliament has. Because if the Scottish Parliament, and as we know at the moment, as it is currently configured, it is the, the sovereign arm, if you like, of the British state in Scotland. It is their, um, it's their authority based here in Scotland to run our affairs. It has notionally uh, been given the powers to do domestic tasks, like basically running the day-to-day -day operations of the country, but it has no powers at all to decide on anything else. And therefore, it is largely 
effectively a British government. And but this is the government which Hamza Yusuf leads. But at the moment, the position of the First Minister and the Scottish Government in terms of whether they think that the Scottish people are sovereign or whether they believe, as it appears at the moment, that the British state is sovereign here. In other words, that the King and uh, the Sovereign Parliament of Westminster can extend its power to rule Scotland. Now, if that is the case, then we have a problem and that changes the whole dynamics of the search not the search, but the process of gaining independence. Because if it is acknowledged by the Scottish Government, the SNP government in power at the moment, and in fact any government in Scotland thereafter, no matter who is elected to Holyrood, if it is the case that the parliamentarians and the politicians only accept the sovereignty of Westminster, then the way we get independence has to change because there can be no way out of the British state if we stick with this particular position. And that is where the convention of these states would come in. However, this is a big however, in order to convene the, um, the convention of the estates, which is a gathering of all of Scotland's elected officials. Now in the old days, it would have been a convention of the three estates. Now, the three estates would have been the nobility, that would be the earls and the lords, and then there was um, a, a second level, which was the, what you call it, I suppose you call it the, the burghers and the baronies. These are the sort of lesser levels, the mid-level, if you like, of uh, the feudal part of Scotland. And then below that was everybody else, represented by the boroughs or the burghers of the various towns and villages. Now, nowadays, the equivalent of that would be all of our elected officials from Holyrood together, um, sitting outside of the Scottish Parliament in the absence of a Scottish crown and in the absence of a Scottish monarch and in the absence of a fully impaired Scottish Parliament that body would be able to take executive decisions such as holding an independence referendum, specifically asking this binary question of the people of Scotland. Now, I've mentioned before that under the terms of, in fact, not under the terms, under the Charter of the United Nations, Scotland um, has the right to self-determination. All peoples have the right to self-determination. But again, we are faced with uh, a problem, and the problem has historically been simple. When the United Nations was formulating this, uh, this charter, and when they, they announced that they wanted to make self-determination a universal human right across the planet and all countries, um, the United Kingdom was asked a question, which was quite a simple one, because at the time the UN understood that Scotland and England had a union, but they didn't know the nature of that union. And so the British state said that Scotland had entered a voluntary union, and therefore was part of a unitary state called Great Britain. Now, you can argue a lot about this, but the basic fact of the matter is that was a lie, because there was never a new kingdom created by this. It was never a unitary country announced. There was simply a union of two nations and it was the crowns that were united. The British crown took precedence over the Scottish crown in Scotland and the Scottish crown jewels were quietly retired and placed in a glass case. But it did not get rid of the Scottish crown and the authority vested in that, not just the actual bauble itself, but in the entire institution of the Scottish crown. The monarchy in Scotland, uh, the power is invested not in the monarch himself or herself, but in the people who actually put the monarch on the throne, and that is us. And therefore, in the absence of our power, and that is, if the Scottish government acknowledges that it is Westminster that has sovereignty here, then that power has been usurped, and the parliament in Scotland at the moment, as it currently configured, is not legitimate and there is no Crown Parliament fully impaired in Scotland, then a modern version of the three estates could be convened and it would have lawful authority to make decisions. So that's a, a real 
I suppose, hand grenade in terms of political thinking in the United Kingdom, and something which the United Kingdom would never recognise and never even acknowledge was true. However, that doesn't mean that's the end of things, and there will be further steps taken. Now, I mentioned at the top of the programme that there was a rumour saying that the Sterling Directive, which basically asks the uh, Parliament of Scotland, or I should say the Government of Scotland, um, to explain its position on this and to decide on which side of the fence it sits. Uh, is it part of the United Kingdom's arm of, of government and authority here, or is it an independent government itself? Does it have the full authority of the sovereign people? So it can not have. It can be in both camps. It has to decide. However, that decision, whenever it comes, uh, has to be communicated because formal letters will be written now to the Scottish Government asking for a response within the time frame which was specified originally, which was 90 days. Now, it's not obviously been 90 days yet, but the fact that we haven't heard anything at all, far less even an acknowledgement that somebody has read the document, is probably a bad indication. However, there are other things going on in Scotland at the moment that are more interesting, and I think one of the most uh, positive things that I've read recently is that the graving dry docks complex in uh, Glasgow on the south side in Govan has been given the go-ahead now for full redevelopment. The graving docks consist of three dry docks. Um, one particularly large one, the two slightly smaller ones, and these are uh, a little bit like canal locks into which you can sail a ship, close the gates, pump all the water out and be able to work on the ships. The proposal was to um, to basically reopen these and uh, to recommission these docks. They do still work. Certainly one of them is working at the moment. And the Queen Mary, which you may notice tied up nearby, has had its deck and funnel removed already in order to get at the engines prior to a refit. And it is planned that the, the Queen Mary will be sailed into one of these docks, the water pumped out, and so that they can work on the hull and the rudder and the propeller and so forth. So this is good news from the point of view of the docks. We'll have a working dry dock. Uh, complex there. And not only that, but there are plans now to bring historic ships from Scotland's past, built here on the Clyde, back to the Clyde and have them refitted and rebuilt in all their original glory using these dry docks. So we have also got the possibility of a massive working dry dock complex which is refitting historic ships built here on the Clyde. So we have a major working historical facility, marine history in action going to happen in Govan, a place which badly needs the employment and the redevelopment that this would bring. Not only is it to do with the dry docks, it also consists of a massive housing uh, or house building uh, plan as well, which will redevelop massive tracts of unused uh, ro uh, riverside property nearby to the docks. And that will also produce valuable housing, which the people of Govan badly need high quality housing and also things like um, business premises, new shops and new public spaces as well. So this is a very good news story for a highly deprived area on the south of the river in Glasgow. So all good news. Now in, in other news today I was noticing some stories talking about the effect of the recent heavy rains um, last weekend on Saturday and it's uh, it's been revealed that something like a month's worth of rainfall fell within about a 36 hour period over that weekend, washing out roads, particularly the, um, the A83 Rest and Be Thankful, which suffered from, I think it was seven different landslides, where thousands of tons of rock and mud fell across the road, blocking it again, as usual. Now, there is a plan to build some kind of open tunnel uh, system, it's basically a roof over the road, open on one side so you can see down the hill, but protecting vehicles from falling rocks and other debris during heavy rainfall. I suspect that it probably would have been an idea also to start planting some vegetation on the hillside, perhaps to try and hold the soil together, but so far I haven't seen any signs of that. So the, the work on that road is going to be essential. Now, if this kind of heavy deluge is going to become more commonplace due to, let's say, the changes in the global climate, 
there are other problems and also the heavy rainfall particularly over central and uh, northeastern Scotland caused massive problems for farmers in fact many farmers who had um, late vegetable crops still in the ground have lost them all because there were feet of water lying on top of these crops making it virtually in many cases a total loss which is going to make it very hard for farmers who grow vegetables which would normally end up in our supermarkets to do so late in the season again this is going to hurt the Scottish economy and it's another part of the resilience that the country needs to build in the future if we're going to have um, self-sufficiency in food we need to think about how we deal with flooding and how uh, our farmers farm the land so these are other things that need to be considered However, um, at the moment, things are largely in abeyance, but I think we can expect to hear shortly from Salvo about the Stirling Directive and how the Scottish Government has reacted to it. In the meantime, there is not much for us to do. However, the next steps, assuming that the Scottish Government were to reply and say that the Scottish people don't actually have sovereignty, that it's just a historical artefact and that it's the British government that has sovereignty, then Scotland would actually need to, be, to actually declare itself and register itself with the United Nations and other international bodies as a British Crown dependency and request, eventually, but request uh, the assistance of the United Nations in the process of decolonisation. Um, and the removal of the exploitation of Scotland's resources which have been annexed unlawfully. Because if Hamza Yusuf and his government's position is that Westminster holds the sovereignty here, then Scotland has effectively been annexed. It is not a free country. It is basically a crown colony, a colony of the United Kingdom which they may exploit to their, their own betterment. And if that's the case, then the road to independence will be a lot longer than it otherwise should be. And it also means that if the Scottish Government reacts in the negative to the Stirling Directive, then it's basically accepting that there is no way out of the Union because nothing that the Scottish Government plans to do in terms of gaining independence through some kind of election plebiscite could actually work, not for independence anyway. It might be used as a way of gaining a mandate to empower the Scottish Parliament to hold a referendum, but again, that might mean, again, re, um, reigniting or uh, reactivating the Convention of the Estates, which is still statutory law in Scotland. We still have the right to actually call that into existence. However, that would take a politician in the Scottish Parliament that would be an MSP, to actually write a formal request for this thing, this new version of the Convention of the Estates, I think you could call it a constitutional convention, to be established and for it to be empowered to hold a referendum. It would need to be written in formal legal language in order for it to come into existence. And that is another question for another day. But I thought I would throw these ideas out to you today just to give you an idea of where we stand at the moment and why it's important for the Scottish Government to react to the Stirling Directive because it is a request from the people of Scotland for a decision from the government on its position on who exactly is sovereign here in Scotland right at this moment. It cannot be both the British uh, Parliament in Westminster as well as the people of Scotland. It just can't be both of them. It has to be one or the other. And at the moment, we just don't know because we're not hearing from our officials. Anyway, that's a, an interesting talking point, something which um, those SNP friends may want to bring up in conversations at the upcoming conference. And it may be worth asking that question directly of government ministers and particularly going all the way to the top and asking Hamza Yusuf himself whether the Scottish Government believes that the people of Scotland are the lawful authority in Scotland or not. Because if they're not, then a whole different series of actions are going to be necessary. And anyway, that's it for me today. I hope you find the, this topic interesting. And also, to take some, uh, some degree of pleasure in the fact that an area of Glasgow which has been so lacking 
in any kind of um, any kind of positive news for a long, long time has now got something to look forward to at the Graving Docks. That's it for me today. As usual, keep the faith, and I'll speak to you later in the week. Bye for now.